bright idea but need the money and a little direction to make it big? Meet Kevin Harrington. With 500 products launched and generating over $4 billion in product sales worldwide, meet Kevin Harrington. Kevin is the ambassador and principal architect of the global direct response industry. He is founder and current chairman of the board of AsSeenOnTV.com Inc. Kevin is one of the co-founders of the Electronic Retailing Association and has been the leader in direct-to-consumer television for more than 25 years. Kevin, along with Michael Dell, also helped establish the Entrepreneurs Organization, which has grown to the world's largest entrepreneurial organization in more than 45 countries. Kevin has created brand after brand in nearly every category, including housewares, fishing, golf, music, fitness, and automotive by combining great products with great superstar talent like George Foreman, Billy Mays, Anthony Sullivan, Jack LaLanne, Montel Williams, Hulk Hogan, Tony Little, and even popular reality stars such as Kim Kardashian, Kathy and Paris Hilton, and Chris and Bruce Jenner. I was fortunate enough to meet Kevin Harrington. He helped me take an idea to, from concept to development, to product, to market, to success. My brand now is worth over $3 billion. Uh, so my advice to everybody, if you even have an idea, you'd want to go to Kevin Harrington. Kevin also collaborated with music mogul 50 Cent in marketing and distribution of his new headphone line. It's the 16-bit lossless wireless technology without losing CD quality. CEO, make this happen. He has appeared in numerous television segments, including 2020. T's, please, and C's. The Today Show. From NBC News, this is Today. Consumer correspondent Janice Lieberman got a preview at the Direct Response Expo. From Snuggies to pajama jeans to easy zipper, selling on TV and serious business. We ran into Kevin Harrington, who was pushing his own gadget, the Instant Zipper. Joan Rivers, how'd you get so rich? We're at the home of the infomercial king, Kevin Harrington. The Big Idea with Donnie Deutsch. Kevin Harrington, CEO of the Lion International and stepfather of the Flow B. The Wendy Williams Show. Please say hello to the chairman of AsSeenOnTV.com, Kevin Harrington. Hey, thank you, thank you. Fox Business. Kevin Harrington is with us right now. He's the chairman of TV Goods and AsSeenOnTV.com. CNN, Good Morning America, and The View. Kevin Harrington. Yay! Hey, Kevin. Right. Instantly, it cleans. This becomes also a push-up machine. So watch that, all right? Push-ups, all right? For more than three decades, Kevin has been featured on both national and international magazine covers and in hundreds of print media. Kevin's acquisition of AsSeenOnTV.com, the world's As Seen On TV portal of the hottest selling products around the world, has positioned him as the ambassador of the As Seen On TV industry. Kevin's popularity spans the globe, and he's appeared in multiple international television programs. You need to really look at the product. Is it a problem solver type of and product? Kevin Harrington hat in den USA, er ist der infomercial king. Not only was Kevin the pioneer of steering national media across the globe, but also broke the mold in bringing famous celebrities into international markets. Thank you for that. Look at Coles out there. That's my amazing company. He has seamlessly entered the Hollywood scene and has even been credited as an executive producer for the film Father of Invention, starring Kevin Spacey and Heather Graham. Ladies and gentlemen, the Robert Axel Air Cutter. Part clippers, part vacuum, salon caliber haircuts in the privacy of your own home without the hairy mess or the heavy pricing. After more than 25 years behind the camera, Kevin was selected to star as an investor shark on the ABC television network hit show, Shark Tank, produced by Mark Burnett, where budding entrepreneurs pitch their product ideas for a chance to sell them and make millions. You need the money, but you need the expertise, and I have the expertise in developing the television, the infomercial side. I came out here and I was gunning for you. Shark Tank has been wildly popular and has produced multiple million dollar products and has become a pop culture phenomenon. Now the last clue, back to the Shark Tank. I'm Kevin Harrington. Sharks do cooperate sometimes. <laughs> Hello, sharks. I'm Daniel Tosh, 
and I am the proud inventor of the high toilet. Kevin is the author of Act Now, How I Turn Ideas into Million Dollar Products. His inspiring autobiography details his personal experiences on his rise to the top and has helped many entrepreneurs and inventors launch their products worldwide. Kevin is sought after all over the world, whether he's throwing out the first pitch in a Major League Baseball game, ringing the NASDAQ bell, or inspiring and teaching students, entrepreneurs, and business professionals. Kevin Harrington is author, marketing guru, advertising celebrity, television personality, ambassador of the Asima TV industry, the billion dollar man, and infomercial king of the infomercial industry. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's so funny, when I watch that, I, I'm not real tall, but when Wendy Williams showed up and she had heels on like this, I, I look like I'm uh, about a foot shorter than she is. So um, I had a great time uh, being part of Shark Tank. Uh, Shark Tank I, I did for three seasons, 175 segments, uh, but I actually took so much time away from my core business, I had ended up with pieces and parts of about 25 companies. So um, it was actually was a, was a very uh, involved uh, b helping build those businesses, much like all of you here. How many are entrepreneurs in the audience? Okay, just about everybody. I think everybody raised their hand. Well, um, I'm really excited to be here in front of uh, a group of entrepreneurs. I've been an entrepreneur since I was probably about nine years old and was actually, as it said, part of the founding of the Entrepreneurs Organization more than 25 years ago. Uh, and I like to be in, uh, involved with many entrepreneurs mentoring uh, many groups and individuals across the world. So uh, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I actually pick a winner and how it applies to my business. Uh, it's picking a winning product. How it might apply to yourselves, some here uh, how many people have actual products versus entrepreneurial businesses? So almost about 50-50. Okay, great. So for me, picking a winner is about picking a winning product. But for the other entrepreneurs that aren't, say, in the product business, picking a winner might be finding the right employee, the right person to run your operations, might be the right partner, the right location, uh, the right mate, whatever it might be. But picking a winner is very important in, in my world for sure. But I'm gonna apply this and actually, today I'm gonna to talk about five cases that, where I show you where I picked a winner and how that worked for me, and then I'm gonna apply it to your business also. So actually, it's a very funny story. About 25 years ago, a gentleman walked in my office and he had this Coca-Cola can and he said, what does that sound to you? And I said, I don't know. He said, that sounds like your next million dollar product. Okay, and I'm like thinking, this guy's pretty strange. You know, what's, what's he talking about? So um, actually, he wasn't correct on the million dollars. It, this became the next billion dollar product. And I'm gonna show you, let's watch this video real quick. Just a couple seconds clip here. Oh, wrong one. Okay, let's go back. This one right there. Pretty simple product idea, but guess what? When he showed me that product, that was a $300 food sealing device. And you know, with his little million dollar demo, I really almost laughed him out of the office because I said, who's gonna buy a $300 food sealer that crushes a Coca-Cola can? What's the point, right? Well, the point was is that the, the presentation was you buy food in bulk, like you buy bacon in bulk or you buy cheese in bulk at $1.50 a pound instead of shrink wrapped into little pieces at $6 a pound and you will save money on your food bill. So as he explained to me the concept of this product, we went ahead and put our money into this project and this became the first ever billion dollar infomercial product and actually the longest running infomercial product today in the industry. So I'm very excited to say this is still running now more than 25 years later. So my next 
picking of a winner was um, a gentleman, his name is Arnold Morris. And Arnold was at the, Phil I was at the Philadelphia Home Show, because I lived there, and one of the people in the audience here can, talk, can actually remember some of this, Colette Lee Antonio, who's gonna be talking to you guys a little later, was involved in this project, but Arnold had a knife, and he was demonstrating this knife at the Philadelphia Home Show, cutting through cans and cutting through hammerheads, and then saying you can cut through a tomato so thin as you can read the Sunday newspaper through this, and this was called actually the Ginsu knife at that particular time. And I watched Arnold in front of 10 people do this demo. And he'd, he would grab 10 people, and five of them, about 50%, would pull out $20 and buy this knife set. And then before, I went to talk to Arnold, before I could get to Arnold, he grabbed another eight or 10 people and was pitching again. And finally, he got on break, and I said, Arnold, how long have you been selling this knife set? And he's like, Kevin, for 30 years, I go from the Philadelphia Home Show to the Iowa State Fair, et cetera, demonstrating this knife set. And that, that's when a light bulb went off, and I said, you know what? What if we took a camera, captured that pitch that Arnold does in front of those people like that, and put it up on TV and take it to millions? Instead of eight people at a time, let's take it to millions of people. And that was one of the infomercials that Colette Lee Antonio and I actually did, and this was one of the early infomercials. Let's watch Arnold, a little clip of Arnold, give his knife presentation. Now, if you take a tomato, the weight of the knife alone cuts that tomato. Let me ask you something. How many knives you have around this sharp if you drop the tomato on top? Pretty sharp, right? You know what one young lady said? <laughs> and you cut him thin. I said, thin, one tomato will last you all week long. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So Arnold is still, he called me yesterday, and I, I haven't talked to Arnold in, in a number of years, and it's just funny because he's got a hot new product for me. So, um, you know, Arnold is, is great, and we went on to sell millions of knives in a very successful show, and, um, you know, again, it was the power of the pitch, and I, and I say the power of the demo. Here's another guy you're going to see, you may recognize, he's got a little bow tie, his name is John Parkin, uh, another one of the products that we did early on. Let's watch the power of this demo. Okay, now I'm gonna put the temperature probe in here. Great. So far, 290, 290. 406. I'm stopping it right here at okay. 592. That's what I have to hate, because my head, can you see that? Let's just show you the kind of protection you can get by using Look at that. How many have ever seen the little bow tie guy, John Parkin? It was a few years ago, but John did dozens of infomercials. He's still doing infomercials. So uh, here again, uh, picking a winner, there's a, a formula that I have, and we're going to talk about that a little bit here uh, in a few seconds, a few minutes. So um, you know, there, there, I said there was going to be five examples. We're now getting to my fourth one. And we've talked about automotive, we've talked about in the kitchen. This one is actually in the world of golf, and it's called the Medicus Golf Club, the first ever golf infomercial, and it's been running now for more than 20 years. Medicus Golf, here we go. What is Top Touring Pro? Take this love the third secret to the perfect swing. There's no secret to simply knowing the proper swing technique. And now you can learn to swing like a pro with the Medicus Hinge Club. The secret of the Medicus is this scientifically engineered hinge that will break whenever a flaw occurs in your swing. So this forces you to groove your swing if you if you do like I do a lot of times, golfing. If you go back too fast or you don't pull it back slowly enough. It, the, the hinge flops and you can't complete your swing. This product has, has done hundreds of millions of dollars, been on the air for more than 20 years. Uh, and and we're really excited about that because golf is such a niche market. Uh, much like the next product I'm gonna show you, this is a fishing product and there's a little story that I always like to tell about the flying lure because this became the number one lure in the world and uh, I'll tell you afterwards how many of these we sold. Let's play that video. 
The flying lure looks, acts, even feels just like my bait, fishing itself with pre-programmed action. It moves through the water just like a glider flies through the air while it gently falls right into the fish's face. The flying lure goes where no other lure has gone before. I've caught crappie, I've caught walleye, stripers. So the flying lure sold over 500 million lures, became the number one lure in the world, and it was really an example of using television to bring your product to life. When you watch the infomercial, you'll see many things that we did there. We had unbelievable testimonials, and this is something that I recommend every entrepreneur do for their own business. Consumer testimonials, okay, that's very, very important. In the Flying Lure, we had kids using it, we had parents, their fa the fathers, we had the wives out fishing, we had, we had not only family testimonials, but we had professional bass uh, pro fishermen using this, using this to win tournaments. We had TV shows, there was a PBS fishing show, and the host of that fishing show was using it. We had retail store owners saying how successful this lure was for the people that, that he had recommended the lure to. These are all the testimonials. We had 65 testimonials. When you think about a fishing lure, a little lure that cost about seven cents to manufacture, and the, guy, the inventor that walked in my office, he says, Kevin, he says, can you sell fishing on television? I'm like, I don't really know. I said, it seems like a niche market. I said, explain to me your product. And he says, well, all lures, when they hit the water, they drop straight down, gravity. He says, I have reverse engineered this lure to hit the water and swim like a wounded fish, and it gets strike after strike. And, he, and I said, this is amazing. I have to see this. So we went and actually cast it in a big hog trough that was about 20 feet long. And we, we showed that there was, there was about eight or 10 fish in there, and we cast regular lures out and watched those lures just drop. And then the flying lure went in, and as it was swimming, the fish were attacking that lure. So that became our next winner and one of the most successful fishing products of all time. So, you know, it's, it is a, it's so much fun to be in an industry like the infomercial industry. I mean, uh, when I was talking to Melissa earlier, she said a lot of times entrepreneurs are afraid to make the projections of their business, right? And, you know, I'm here today beyond just my presentation. I'm going to be looking at products and presentations and investor uh, pitches, product pitches, et cetera. And I'm going to tell you right now, whoever would have thought that the Snuggie would do three... $400 million in sales, okay? I mean, this is a blanket with arms, okay? So, I mean, it's this, look at Al Roker wearing a Snuggie and Ellen DeGeneres, and it was on, you know, all the, Jay Leno, unbelievable. But, you know, it, yes, it's sold in all the retail stores, but the Snuggie was programmed for success because they invested a lot of money into social media. They did pub crawls. They did all kinds of uh, PR and, and press releases and announcements and in-store demos. And they spent over, and it didn't all happen all on the front end, but they ended up spending over a million dollars worth of social media and publicity efforts to drive the sales of that product. So, um, you know, it, in, in starting a business, you have to plan for your success because, you know, I do say yes, and we'll talk about failure in a little bit. Sometimes you have to fail a few times to get that successful one. Don't be afraid to do that for sure. But I, I think, you know, I talked about picking a winner and how I do that. And I really, I have like a three-step system that I use. And this, set, this system is, is, is pretty simple. Um, I'm going to try to help you apply it to your own business. Because the first thing for me is I put my mind into a curiosity overload situation. And people that know me know, number one, I go to probably 20 plus trade shows a year. And these are two, three, four day events. I was just at the houseware show. I was just at the electronic retailer conference. Before that, I was at the CES show. 
and the hardware show is coming up, and there's the beauty show, then the hair show, how about the PGA golf show, toy fair, et cetera. Now, I'm in a lot of these industries, but I like to go to these shows because I get to see the trends, what's hot, what's working. I go to the new product sections and check out the new products. I get the press releases. I go to the media room. I'm on curiosity overload when I spend time at these shows. And I also, I have a trick that I use when I work the shows. A lot of people, they come to a show and I've gone, I'll take people from my company to a show and they're like, there's just too many boots and they're all just these big boots and the big you know, Westinghouse brands and these big companies, they don't have anything unique and innovative. I say, no, l let me tell you, you, you don't just walk right to the center and you see all the big boots. Go down the aisle, all the way in the back corner is where those entrepreneurs that just got in I met a, a, two guys from Korea about 10, 12 years ago, and they were in the very far back corner. They had just gotten in. They had a 10 by 10 booth that put their last dollars into renting that booth, and they had an infrared technology that cooked chickens and turkeys from the inside out. And, and I'm t listening to them tell me about this technology. That became the flavor wave oven. It's now the new wave oven. And I tied up the rights to that deal within 48 hours of meeting them at the Chicago Houseware Show. So uh, this is one of the things that I do. And it's not just trade shows. You know, I like to speak in front of groups like this on a regular basis. But I also, I get a, a lot of catalogs. I'm going to tell you about that in just a second. But I, I get dozens and dozens of trade journals that I get on a daily, weekly basis. I subscribe to four newspapers a day. Um, let me tell you one of the really clever things that I did years ago, because I used to get, many people think you get a catalog in the mail. What is it, junk mail? Well, guess what? For me, this is deal mail for me, okay? This is where I find hot products. Well, what did I do? I found a catalog, and I used to carry it with me, but it's, it's this thick. It's called the Directory of Mail Order Catalogs, and literally is almost 2,000 pages because there are 2,000 catalogs listed in this big, thick directory. And every industry, there's dozens and dozens of catalogs. I sent a, a letter to every catalog company, it's about 12 years ago, and said, I'm an avid catalog buyer, could you please send me your catalog? And I didn't get quite 2,000, but I got over the next three months, I got 1,500 catalogs sent to my home address. Not the business, because I didn't want it mixing in. Now, my wife's very upset it comes to the home, because at Christmas time, the mailman brings this many catalogs every day, because that's the heavy duty time of the year that catalogs get mailed. And so what do I do? I segment them into all the different industries and I have fishing catalogs and golf catalogs and houseware and hardware and beauty. And so when I look, somebody comes in my office and says, I have a beauty product. I have a fishing product. I go to the catalogs. A friend of mine had a pet product. And I went instantly. And I went through. And yeah, this is kind of like going on the internet. But catalogs are even better because this is proven products now. If you see something, I would see a product in the pet catalogs in one, in two. By the time you see it in the third catalog, Guess what? It's working, OK? That's a winner. Focus on that product. So curiosity overload is very good. And it's, it will put you into a position of being exposed to many, many different opportunities. The next thing that I say is you need to hijack your habits. And I have a saying, and you may have heard this, but if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. And that's why I always say to myself, how can I hijack? In other words, I'm going this direction, but wait a minute, let's hijack it, take it that way instead, okay? And when I do this, this makes, forces me to think outside the box. And so I'll tell you about 20 years ago, I was sitting with a library of infomercials, and every infomercial would go up, would have success, and then, just like movies, kind of in a similar thing. You see a movie come out, it's got all kinds of buzz, and it's in the theaters, and then a couple months later, where is it? Well, it's gone, it's out of the theaters. What happened? It went international. I said to myself, wait a minute, I've got all, I got 100 shows in my library. What am I gonna do with them? Take them 
international. So what I did, I said, where do the movies, how do the movies go international? They go to the Cannes Film Festival once a year in France. What a great place to go hang out, right? So 1989, I took a 10 by 10 booth out at the Cannes Film Festival and said, I have infomercials and I'm going to pay you to run my infomercials in your market. And overnight, I got instant distribution into a couple dozen countries. Rupert Murdoch gave us distribution on Sky Channel. We got distribution with the Marcucci family in Italy, with the Kinovic Group, which owned all the TV stations up in Sweden and, and, and Denmark. And then we got distribution into Holland, into Germany. Then we went to Latin America. Then we went to Asia. And when we launched these shows all around the world, for example, Tony Little, let's watch this video, Tony Little. And here's all the countries worth of distribution. At the end of this show that would air, what we actually did was we set up one video track that would go all across satellite, all across Europe. And then we leased audio tracks such that in Germany, you could pull down the German voice track, in Holland, the Dutch track, in Sweden, the Swedish track. And now we had instant distribution all across Europe in the local languages with local fulfillment centers and phone centers in the local country. And this took our company from 100 million a year to over 500 million dollars a year because we took the same asset in the US and took it all around the world, just dubbing it into the local language. Again, hijacking my old habit of just being happy to make money on that US infomercial. The next one we did, and you, you've probably seen this girl quite a bit, this is her first ever infomercial, and we did very interesting things with this around the world. Let's watch Kim Kardashian in Spanish. She'd like to buy this footage back for me because she doesn't. She, how many times have you seen her with an iron? Okay, uh, Kim Kardashian. That was her first infomercial. We gave her twenty-five hundred dollars total buyout. That's all she got, and and it was amazing because this is right as she was getting to be famous, but she wasn't like over the top famous yet. So it, you know, I love working with celebrities, and I can tell you a lot of cool stories about celebrities, but um, that's for another day. So I mean, I think you know. The concept of hijacking is to me very important and, and I do it every day in my life. And I will say this though, you know, we don't always have success. And you know, I like to say that before I'm successful, a lot of times talking about the F word, I have failure, okay? Because you know, yes, I've shown you a lot of commercials and infomercials of successful shows. Let me talk about a couple that didn't work and maybe some of the reasons why because finding and picking the winner involves having those losers also okay um, here is chubby checker in his first infomercial let's watch that now you can put on your favorite music and have fun dancing all those extra inches and pounds away presenting the one of a kind low impact calorie burning muscle pump Oh, I should have known with a, with a name like Chubby, we couldn't sell something that was fitness oriented, okay? Uh, but Chubby Checker was a big failure, okay? So, um, but, you know, there were reasons why that didn't work, and, you know, part of it uh, was my fault, part of it was Chubby's fault, part of it was the product. But, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I will tell you that you don't always succeed, and even guys like Tony Little and Billy Mays, because I'm, I'm gonna talk about Billy Mays. I did Billy Mays first infomercial. I found Billy Mays at the, at, at actually back in Pittsburgh where he was from, and Billy, this was his first infomercial, and you watch a couple seconds of this and you'll understand why this didn't work. Let's take a look.
Okay, that didn't look like Billy Mays, right? God bless him, he passed away a couple years ago. But Billy, thank God he didn't stop with that failure because that was a total disaster, okay? Um, and actually, what we said, and I didn't, I wasn't enough of a, of a, a good enough producer at that time to understand, hey, Billy, when I saw you at the Pittsburgh uh, fair that you were demonstrating, you had the energy and you were pitching and you were dynamite, you know? But when you came to the show, you were terrible, okay? So, you know, these are the things that you learn along the way. And I mean, you know, so not everybody is successful. I mean, Tony Little, we've done a ton of things with. Tony Little, he hit bottom. He was a bodybuilder. He was in a car accident and he hit rock bottom. He had, was out. He didn't want to do anything. He didn't, he didn't want to even leave his house. And so I always say, though, that the people like Billy Mays, like Tony Little, like myself, and hopefully just like you guys here, because being an entrepreneur is all about failing your way to success, because not everybody is successful all the time. I fail on at least two out of three, three out of four of the attempts that I make in trying to come out with a product. In fact, what that means is when you fail, what you need to do is my third step, bounce higher and come back. And you know, so I think that it's, it, there's, sometimes you need a little help to be able to do this. Sometimes you have to come back. Uh, maybe you have a mentor or maybe you have a club that you're involved with, uh, an organization. You need to get some advice sometimes on getting back in the game. And you know, before we talk a little bit about all of that, I'm just gonna talk about real quickly some of the 10 things, because I know there's a bunch of product people here that, that have some products. And I, I wanna tell you that these are 10 things that, that I look for. Colette may have some different ideas when she talks in a little bit, but I look for something that is mass market. Um, problem solving is generally the first thing that an inventor does, is they say, does this solve a problem? So I look for that, very important. Uniqueness, it's easy to say that, but I like to say, is it unique enough that there's nothing else in the market that currently solves the problem in a similar fashion? That is unique then, okay? Um, so the, you know, number four is, can you show a magical transformation? In weight loss, it's heavy and slim. In acne, it's pizza face to clear skin. It, you know, there's magical transformations in infomercials many, many times. Uh, is it demonstrable? It, you know, it, Arnold's slicing through the Coca-Cola can. In the food saver, you're crushing the Coca-Cola can. So, you know, demonstration is very important. And we talk about some money shots like on the car wax show, John Parkin with the bow tie, what's he doing? He lights the car on fire and he shows that it didn't hurt the paint afterward because the wax was so powerful that it protected the fire from the paint. And that was memorable. People always said to me, oh, you're the guy that lit that Rolls Royce on fire. Um, is there an emotional tie-in or a story that your product has? Uh, and, and that, in many cases, Montel Williams, for example, he's one of the most powerful guys at selling with emotion because he talks about he's got MS and he wears that Tommy Copper bra the arm brace that gives him some increased blood flow and he gets emotional when he sells and can bring you from tears to laughter in a moment. Uh, also, I look for multifunctionality on products, something that can do um, one demo to the next to the next. At the end of the day, the value and the last two things get down to cost of goods and pricing. The, the offer has to make sense financially. You've got to have a good cost of goods. In our world, we say a four to five time markup. And, and, and some, you know, if it's a 1995 product, we like to see a, you know, like a three, four, five dollar cost, no more. It's a hundred dollar product, twenty to twenty-five dollars, and you always hear about tie-ins like, "But wait, there's more." You know, if you buy now, you'll also get. So you need to throw some tie-ins, create this value package. Uh, so that's just a quick little summary of some of the must-haves. And 
you know, I started this last segment here talking about bouncing higher. So let's talk about and show you how Billy Mays, what did he do? Billy bounced higher. This was his last infomercial that he ever did before he passed away. And watch this. I did this with Billy. Here to tell you more are Billy Mays and Anthony Sullivan. Hi, I'm Billy Mays. And I'm Anthony Sullivan. The Dole Saw is no ordinary saw. It uses counter rotating technology to cut through all types of material with unmatched safety, speed, and precision. It's a process that took eight years and cost millions of dollars to develop. Until now, this technology has only been available for industrial purposes. That's the powerful Billy Mays we all remember, right? So, you know, Billy, he perfected the art of delivering one of the most powerful pitches. And yes, he bounced higher. In fact, you saw Tony Little. Tony had hit rock bottom, but now look at this. This was his billion dollar product. Let's watch a clip of the gazelle. I'm working my buttocks. If I lean forward, I'm working my chest. I'm working my triceps. I'm working the back of my calves. And I'm working my heart and I'm working my lungs. Tony's fabulous. He's so funny. Um, he actually is a very shy guy, so a lot of people don't know that. But, um, and, you know, so uh, I know I, I was given 40 minutes, and I think I'm just down to around uh, 30 seconds left. So I'm going to wrap up by telling you, you know, I live my life a certain way, and Tony Little lives his life. And this is just a quick one from Tony. Uh, Tony says, You can do it. And that's what I want to say to you guys because. I carry a little card with me at all times, and I say that life's battles don't always go to the fastest or the strongest. Sooner or later, those who win are those that think they can. And Melissa, I think we've got a lot of people that think they can win that are in this crowd here today. So thank you guys for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Um, are we taking questions now? Yes, Are we gonna do that? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, great, okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, you win the blonde. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Right. Good question. Uh, she's talked about Tony Robbins does successful uh, kind of personal empowerment. But he actually, what he does, which is very effective, is he demonstrates the success of his product by the testimonials that are in the show. And really, what, you know, if, I, I remember when I first watched Richard Simmons, uh, was a master at doing this, and Tony Robbins does kind of the same thing, a little different, but Richard Simmons would bring somebody on, and he would show that they would talk how they were so heavy that they couldn't ride a bicycle, and, and they were crying, and Richard was crying with them, and then they would come out riding a bicycle on the air, and that was the demonstration of the, the, the change, the magical transformation. So Tony Robbins uses a lot of that kind of stuff, people that were so afraid that they couldn't get up in front of a group or they couldn't do this or they couldn't do that and now you know they've had either a financial gain or a, a job promotion or whatever but um, we did it with memory tapes um, how to get better memory and in memory uh, we said if you get better memory you know a guy walked out and he, he had met 40 people before everyone started and then he could name all those people but how do you apply that to your daily life well if, if, if the woman is a head of PTA, she remembers all 10, 12 people like that. If you're a salesman at a car dealership, remembering people's names is great because you're going to sell more cars. And if you're a child in school, having better memory will take you from a C to an A. So there's the demonstration, and that's in, in, in audio tapes, self-improvement. Yes?
Well, you know, a lot of shows, I mean, I'll start some infomercials with 10 testimonials, and they go pop, 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 pop. Huh? Oh, you're talking about here today. Oh. Well, you, you're just going to, I mean, you could show me letters, you can, you're presenting later. Okay. I mean, like, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, if in, in the future, if you're going to make a presentation, you, you know, you, if you, you can tell me about it, if you're just telling me, but you, you also, I mean, a letter, like I said, when we did the Flying Lure, we had Bass Pros, we had kids, we had mothers, we had uh, TV show authors, we had editors from the fishing magazines, so you can, boom, 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 you can show me all that with letters and things like that, but in today's presentation, just tell me about it, and then you can send it later, okay? Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, um, Melissa has th things. We'll go through Melissa for contact. But uh, yes, I mean, over the years, we've you know we've started people at very early stages. Um, it's if you came to me and said, I have a I have a new car that I want to make, and I'm in the early stages. I'd say that's not for me. If if it's the more electrically oriented and the more involved it is, the you know the less likely we are. If this is going to be a $500, you know, electrical product that's going to require tremendous amounts of of years of development and millions of dollars, we're probably not going to be the right player for that. But if you have something that's you know kind of something that's mass market, a kitchen gadget, or something, uh, the hardware, or something fast, and maybe it's a hair product, or I know Colette has done some really cool hair things that you know cost about two bucks to make, they sell for $10, and they sold millions of them, and it's some, it's some plastic, and some this, and some that. Yeah, we get involved in things at all stages. And, and Melissa can give you uh, my email. Yes, back there. Okay, good question. I mean, I, you know, in the early days, I had a lot of failures. And, you know, sometimes we would go 10 in a row before we would hit something. And so, you know, as an entrepreneur, this is why I said curiosity overload. Because while I'm failing, I'm out at that next trade show. I just saw something that I really love. So I'm, I'm putting my hopes now back on that next one. And... Even if you're in the movie business, I mean, these big companies, Time Warner and, and Spielberg, they, you know, they have flops all the time. And these are, these are you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of flops. In my business, you might flop for 100 grand, 50 grand, 200 grand, 300, whatever the number, but it's much smaller. But every time I have a failure, I still have something over here that I'm counting on that's going to be my next hit. So that's why I never give up. And that's why you also... I, I'm never the kind of guy that puts all his eggs in one basket. I, I know people that say, look, I only want to do one thing and one thing perfect, and when I'm done with that, then I'll start on something new. That's not me. I'm working a couple things so that when that either fails or fails, either fails or succeeds, I still have something else that I'm counting on. Okay, yes, over there. Yes, I mean, prototypes, there's a bunch of people that do it. Um, I actually have a cousin, his name is Rick Harrington. He worked for Kenner Toys. Um, he's, an, he's an industrial engineer. And he, he's uh, about my age, so he's been around you know, 30 plus years as an engineer. And at Kenner, they would come down and say, he did all the Star Wars prototypes. So they would come down in the morning and say, okay, we just had this brainstorm. We need something like this. You got 48 hours, get us something. And that's what he did. So he, but he can do mechanical stuff. He can do plastics. He's one of a couple 
you know, guys that we use. So I can turn you on to that. Anywhere from $1,000 to 10 grand, you know, depends on how, how sophisticated, you know, if there's, if there's motors and there's parts. Um, you know, he did, he did one for me. There was a lighter that had to have two, two different flames shooting up, and that was like 2,500 bucks. You know, it, was, it took him, you know, they, 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 they make, they don't make a lot of money making prototypes because they look to be involved in the long run. So they generally try to price it pretty affordably to the entrepreneurial marketplace. Yes, ma'am. Sure. I mean, see, th this is the thing. You know, I'm looking at a new fishing product right now, and the guy that came to me knows that we made 500 million of these fishing lures already. When we went to the hook manufacturer, it was called Anchor, um, uh, I forget the Anchor something or other hook company, um, these guys, we, our opening order was 17 million hooks, okay? So, because we were selling, you got like 10 to a pack, right? So. Um, they were just like blown away. So when we get into the fishing world, we say, remember this? Okay, yeah, well, oh, this is gonna be huge quantity. We get instant low pricing. When we do fitness, we go to the same place that did Tony Little's Gazelle, for example, and they know that was a billion dollar product. So yeah, we get good deals and we can help you source your, your stuff. Yes, ma'am. This will actually be the last question. Okay. Um, first, when I first started, I actually used, I had I'd been kind of successful as a young entrepreneur through uh, late high school and into college. I sold a business, had a little bit of money, not a lot, like, you know, I think I had, a, you know, $50,000 earned and saved at a young age. So I used my own capital to invest in a couple deals, and fortunately, not everything in the early days worked, but it was, it, we, we did things on a low budget. So we, I was able to do multiple things with my own money. But very quickly, my own money ran out because financing the growth then required millions of dollars. And so how I really survived from the early days on was I used other people's money then, okay? So um, generally what that entailed was um, either getting the person that had a, the product that we were gonna get involved with, if they had money, we, let, we, we, we took our expertise and we said, look, we're gonna bring our expertise to the table and you're gonna bring some capital to the table and together we'll take this and run with it, okay? Now, if they didn't have the capital, what we assisted in was helping them raise the money based on our track record. So, um, because I always say, if you have a good idea, a good product or a good business, you can, if you can present it in a proper fashion, you'll be able to raise money. And you know, I, to this day, I mean, I just, I was uh, at a crowdfunding meeting uh, earlier today where there's a group that's gonna be setting up a whole crowdfunding site, much like a, a Kickstarter type of thing. And so nowadays, you've got all these other crazy ways on the internet to even raise money. But, um, you know, there are, you know, you can first, you know, the, the, the close circle to you are friends and relatives. A lot of people don't like to go to friends and relatives, but you go to um, organizational contacts. I mean, for example, um, Entrepreneurs Organization, which there's a Tampa chapter, there's a New York chapter, there's chapters in all the major markets everywhere in the world. You go to an Entrepreneurs Organization meeting and they have connections to people that want and are willing to invest money in new ideas and funding entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, raising money is, is not as tough as it sounds if you have a good business plan and you have the expertise or people that are involved with you. And to that point, right now, I'm involved with a group that has a small business and they asked me to be on their board of advisors and they asked me, and I'm gonna, they're giving me a little piece of equity in the business, just a little piece, they own the whole thing. I'm gonna have just, you know, kind of a, 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 a tiny share to help them. But 
I'm going to help them raise capital. I'm going to have them put business plans together. So if you can get somebody that has a good sphere of influence in your business to be part of what you're doing in addition to yourself, that goes a long way to an investor because then there's, it's kind of a, a credibility situation. But raising the capital is very important because it's, you know, in the last 14 months, I've been involved, I've raised over $25 million in a couple different deals of other people's capital. And I started the whole thing by putting the first million dollars in myself, but then raised 24 plus million dollars around it. So it's, that is ultimately the way to go because you know most people that are starting their business aren't gonna have enough money to do what they need to do.